Well, good morning. All right. I'm glad you are fired up. I am fired up as well. One cup of coffee is all I need. Here we go. Can I just say holy mackerel real quick? Okay. Yeah, thank you. 2017 is over. It is Christmas season. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. I cannot believe that we are at the end. 2017 is winding down, and it's Christmas time, and it's such a good time of the year. It brings a lot of joy, fun, family, and it's, it's a great time of year, especially in church where we get to remember the birth of Jesus, God's Son, but it may also bring some other emotions that maybe aren't so uh, welcoming of frustration, anxiety, and just craziness dealing with family. That could be an emotion that you don't want to deal with. In the, in the holiday season, but one of my favorite times, or why I like Christmas so much, is because of the holiday movies, the Christmas movies, that we get to watch, right? I mean, they are, they are so good, and you would just be weird to watch them outside of Christmas, so when Christmas time comes, you got to make sure you get all those good movies in, because you don't want to miss out on that opportunity once a year to watch these great films. So I did some research, and I was going to find out exactly what movies were the most popular Christmas movies. And in my research, these are the top three, and I want you guys to let me know, applaud or whatnot, if you agree, okay? Number one, A Christmas Story. Shoot your eye out, kid, right? I mean, that's one that we probably watch every single year. Number two, It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that'll pull on your heartstrings, won't it? Zuzu's pedals, every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings, we probably watch that one every single year. And third, and I don't know why it wasn't number one, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Yeah! I mean, that one is an absolute riot. That movie cracks me up every single time that I watch it. Another notable movie that didn't make it into the top three was Home, Home Alone. Excuse me, Home Alone. Home Alone, did you guys realize they made five of them? Can you believe that? Five Home Alones. And I got to confess, I do not like sequels. They just let me down. Like, the original is always so much better, in my opinion, and sequels let me down. But Home Alone, if you've never seen Home Alone, I'm going to summarize the plot for you real quick, okay? So there's a family, they have a young boy, and the writer of the movie had to convince us as the audience that it was possible to leave that young boy at home as they take an international, across uh, the ocean, Christmas vacation, okay? They leave a small boy at home, then robbers try to come, break into the house, and the boy defends the house, and it's an awesome movie. It's a great plot, it's a great story, and you've probably seen it. Okay? I want to share with you a little bit about when I got separated from my family. And if you were in my family, I'm one of six boys, you would have known this would have happened very often. Could you imagine taking six boys out in the public and trying to wrangle them? And I don't know how my parents did it. Bless them. But anyhow, so one time we're at the High Valley Mall, Christmas shopping. We're in Sears. And my brother Marty's the one right above me. And uh, we get separated from the group. And he is hysterical. He's crying. He's upset, distraught. Ask him, you probably won't say that, but I'm going to say that because that's how it was. He was, just, he was just so upset that we got separated from the group. Me, I'm like, freedom, right? I'm jumping on the treadmills. I'm getting on the elliptical machines, and I'm, I'm riding that thing as fast as I possibly can. I jump over on the Bowflex. I'm trying to do this heavy weight. I'm just a little boy, man, trying to pump some iron. But anyhow, so my brother finally wrangles me in. And we got to go to the service desk. And this is the most embarrassing announcement any parent wants to hear at Christmas time, right? Shh, Mr. and Mrs. Jellison, please come to service desk four, right? Like to come get your kids. Everybody knows that announcement at the holiday season. You know, some kid got separated from their family. But we got reunited. We're all good. We finished out our Christmas shopping that day. It was wonderful. And the same thing is true in Home Alone, right? The story of Home Alone, the parents finally figure out that they've left their boy at home, and they do come home all is well. Now, how many have seen Home Alone four or five times? 50, 100 times? Come on, right? I mean, some of us have seen it a lot over and over and over again. It's such an iconic Christmas movie that we do. We tune in and we watch it probably, probably every single year. Now, here's why I bring this up. When we watch a story or hear a story or listen to a story over and over and over again, sometimes we, 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 we forget what really the plot's all about. We know the exclamation point. We're probably tempted to fast forward and home alone to the robbers coming, because that's the funny part. And we miss all of these subplots and these sub-themes and these nuances and, and these different things that we just kind of glaze right over because we're bringing so much information and awareness about the story, we just forget 
to pay attention to the little details. Same thing is true for the Christmas story. Now, disclaimer, the Christmas story isn't just a fictional story like Home Alone probably is. The Christmas story of the birth of God's son is a real historical event that took place. And when we read it, everything is true of how this story that we're going to, I'm going to call it a story, it, it plays out. It plays out just like this in history, and it's a real, actual historical event. And we can bring so much knowledge and so much awareness to this story that we can miss out. We can't see it with fresh eyes, a fresh perspective. We miss some, some very powerful nuances, some very powerful subplots and themes and lessons that God wants to show us through this story. We just blaze right over because we know the punchline. We have so much information and awareness about the story that we miss it. So today, a new approach is what we're going to do. We're going to see some interesting aspects about the story that we have maybe missed and get some new, fresh insights. The series that I'm kicking off today is called Fresh Eyes, Seeing Christmas in a New Light. And that's what we're going to do. Over this series, we'll look at some specific characters in the story, some very specific nuances, plot twists, some crazy things, and find in this story very helpful, practical, and inspiring new insights into the story that we probably know so well. And when we do this, get these fresh eyes, we will be reminded in such a fresh way about how much God loves each and every one of us. Fresh eyes. When we look at Christmas with fresh eyes, we start over, start fresh, we will see some very interesting plot twists, right, that are very unlikely to happen if we were writing the story. If we were writing the, this story and bringing God's son into the world in the way that we would plan it, nothing like what God is going to do, such as there's no room for them in the end, okay, right? They get denied a room at the end. Seriously, God, you don't have any connections? You can't pull some strings and, and get us into this hotel, right? We would do that. And then they get denied and they got to go into a barn and birth the baby in a barn and put him in a manger. <laughs> Crazy stuff. Are you for real? This is really how the Son of God is going to be brought into the world? Leading up to this, they had a long, difficult journey on a donkey to get to Bethlehem in the first place. Could you imagine being almost nine months, eight, nine months pregnant on the back of a donkey coming in? Unreal, unbelievable craziness coming out of this story. Now, my question, and maybe your question, is why such humble beginnings? Right? Why wouldn't God bring his son Jesus with prestige and power and extravagance and this really massive event that would just put an exclamation point on bringing Jesus, the son of God, into the world that would just get everybody's attention? Right? Why wouldn't he do it this way? We would not write the story the way that God wrote the story. And this is very important for us to understand because if we're honest, let's be honest for one second here. We wonder what God's doing in our own life and in our own story, right? I mean, God, like, why are you writing my story of life this way? And the Christmas story, looking at it with fresh eyes, is a great reminder that God always writes better stories than we can. He is a way better author than we could ever be. He writes way better stories than we can. So, if we could wipe our brains, right, start completely fresh with no knowledge and awareness about the Christmas story, have fresh eyes and new perspective, I guarantee we would not bring the Son of God into the world the way that God brought him into the world. There are some ridiculous plot twists. For instance, a scandalous pregnancy, okay? You have a virgin teenage girl who becomes pregnant. She can legally be stoned to death because out of wedlock she became pregnant, Man, the law, the culture, you could be killed for doing that. Crazy, right? Absolutely crazy. Then you have a, a, uh, a uh, fiancé who is going to break off the engagement because she's knocked up. We're not married. It's not my kid, right? Could you imagine the thoughts and the feelings going on? Like, yeah, let's, let's explain this to these people. They're not going to believe that the Holy Spirit got you pregnant, that God put this baby inside of you. They're going to think it was me, and that's just going to be crazy for all of us. Can you imagine? That's crazy. That is so, so outrageously crazy, right? So then they get denied a room in the end. I've already said that. A barn birth in a manger. That's crazy. What a plot twist that was. Seems like a lot of poor planning went into bringing the Son of God into the world, right? Somebody forgot to go to Expedia.com and book the travel arrangements and book the hotel reservation so that everything could just be great and perfect and ideal for Jesus, the Son of God, to be brought 
into this world. I could just imagine this for a second, all right? So God is up in heaven. He's like, hey, I'm gonna, I need to bring my son into the world to save uh, all these people. Gabriel, angel Gabriel, will you help me? Will you take care of some of this, all right? So God trusts Gabriel. Gabriel, he, he does his thing, and then God goes, oh, wow. Yeah, so that's a, you kind of botched that. I'm gonna have to let you go, Gabe, right? Like, I mean, it just seems like very poor planning in our eyes from our perspective with the way we see things and the way that we want things to be written it's so opposite of what we want. We would never write it this way. We would have prestige. We would have power. We would have extravagance. We would have this elaborate ceremonial birth. Things would be perfect, and we would have ideal conditions if you and I got to write the story. And you know why I know this? Because we want perfect and ideal conditions in our own story, don't we? We wanna write our story our way, the way that we want it to play out, and it would be perfect and it would be ideal. We would not write the Christmas story the way God wrote it because many times we do not agree with the way God is writing our own story. Don't we have plot twists in our life, in our story? Don't we have crazy events and circumstances that come up that cause some crazy confusion and frustration and pain and hurt? And we look up at God and go, this isn't how it's supposed to be. God, this, this, this is not supposed to be part of my script. This is not the way that my story should be unfolding in this world and in this life. Things like, you know, I should have been captain of the sports team, not this other person. You know, maybe it was, you you were supposed to get into that college and you didn't, and now you're at this college and you're behind and you're not gonna graduate on time and you're like, God, I was supposed to be done with school by now. And maybe it's, maybe you were supposed to be married by 30. God, why, why am I not married by 30? God, why am I not having kids? God, why, why am I not happy in my marriage? This is not the way it was supposed to be. God, why are my kids rebelling against me? This, I was supposed to have the perfect family. I was supposed to have the perfect job, my dream job. God, why is this not the way my story is unfolding? Let's be honest. Our lives have some crazy plot twists that we never saw coming, and we would never plan or write in our own story. And the same is true for the Christmas story. There are some crazy plot twists, unforeseen events that transpire. And when we look at it with fresh eyes, we can start to unveil these and see these things. And my question is, God, why why did you write the Christmas story this way? Why? And you know why? He knew. He knew that our lives would feature some crazy, ridiculous plot twist. He knew. He knew that our life would feature some crazy cast of characters that go by the name of mom, dad, in-laws, brother, sister, relatives, boss, co-workers. The list goes on. We have a crazy cast of characters in our story, in our life. He knew that we would live in a broken world. And he wrote the Christmas story this way and brought his son into the world in this fashion to be a reminder to us, an invitation every year to know this fact. God can be trusted with your story. God can be trusted with your story. He's a way better author and story writer than we could ever be. And today we're gonna hear from one of the characters in the story that knows about plot twists. I mean, she knows what it's like to be blindsided, to face drama, to face fear, a a huge amount of uh, uncertainty. She's got confusion in her life right now, and she's like, it's the kind of confusion that happens in our life and then with our relationship with God. There's there's two-way confusion here that this character knows about. And yet, in the middle of all of this uncertainty, in in the smack dab middle of this event and circumstance in her life, she speaks some words that are a gift, an absolute gem to you and me. And my hope is that you carry these words that this character says, and you speak them over every plot twist, every unforeseen event and circumstance that pops up in your life that blindsides you, you would speak these words. And it will bring you peace. I hope it will bring you peace in your times of uncertainty. It will bring you hope when you are facing fear and feel hopeless. And when we can when we can look through the eyes of this teenage girl, we can see the Christmas story with fresh eyes, a new perspective. And when we can do that, we can see our own lives, our own story in a new way, in a new light, with a new perspective, with fresh 
eyes. God can be trusted with your story. He is here, he is with us, he's on the move, and he wants to write your story. Will you let him, will you respond, respond in faith and trust God? We'll be in the book of Luke chapter one in the scripture. If you wanna turn there in your Bible, feel free, smartphone, tablet, whatever you wanna tune in, please do so. Scriptures will be on the screen. We'll pick up Luke one, verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Bam, angel Gabriel, who was in charge of planning the birth of Jesus, right? They got fired. He shows up to Mary and says, hey, you are highly favored in the Lord. And Mary's like, okay, well, this is weird. Wouldn't that be weird for you if an angel just popped up and started talking to you? It would be a little unsettling. You'd have some questions in your mind. You'd be like, what's going on? Is this for real? Is this really happening? You could just imagine the emotion that, that she's feeling in this moment when the angel appeals to her, appears, to, appears to her. Now, I wanna let you know there's three famous biblical births, okay? Number one is Abraham and Sarah. Number two is Zachariah and Elizabeth. And the third one is Mary. Now, the first two were met with great skepticism because the women were older and barren and considered unable to have children. But God intervened and blessed them so that the husband and wife could conceive a child, and they did, and it was a miracle. But still, people were skeptic of it, okay? Mary, can you imagine Mary? She's about to receive the news that she's gonna become pregnant, and she's a virgin. She doesn't have a husband. There's no way for her to conceive naturally because she's not married. Could you imagine getting that news as a young teenager? And what I want us to see is how she responds to getting this news. It's a gift, it's a gem. It's such an amazing response from Mary. Verse 30, the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with, with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Wow, amazing news that Mary is receiving. And she's skeptical. Look at how she asked this question in verse 34. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? She's asking a fantastic question. She understands that if this is really gonna happen, my life, Mary, is in jeopardy because I'm unwed, I'm pregnant, I can be stoned to death legally in this time and in this culture. Put yourself in her shoes and imagine the uncertainty, the fear, the doubt, the crazy plot twist that's unfolding right now in her life. Not the best of news to get as an unwed teenager, is it? Not the best of news to get. Now, we all have uh, circumstances in our life where we face fear and uncertainty. And I wanna share one with you in my life. Emily and I, we were not married, we were engaged, okay? And we we're gonna get married in October 17th. So leading up to that, I had two more semesters of college at West Liberty, okay? So I'm finishing up my schooling, I don't really have any income, poor college kid, you know, just getting through, trying to get through, start my career, start making money to be able to provide for my soon-to-be family. Emily graduated a semester before me, and she got her nursing degree, and she was studying and prepping to take her licensing exam so she could practice nursing here in the state of West Virginia. In the meantime, while she was studying and prepping, she was working at Cracker Barrel up at the Highlands, okay? So that's what she's doing. She's got her own little apartment. She's self-sustaining, a little bit of income. I have no income. Six days before our wedding, Cracker Barrel shuts down. Anybody remember that? Cracker Barrel to Highlands literally just shut down. No warning, no nothing. They just put it in a box truck and hauled it out. It was crazy. So now Emily is jobless. I'm jobless finishing up school. We're getting married in six days. Could you imagine the emotion going through our minds at that point in time? God, what are we going to do? How are we going to make it? There was so much uncertainty and fear around that situation and circumstance in our life. And we came together and said, God, we trust God you to write our story. We trust you to work this out. We're gonna be faithful. We're gonna do what you told us to do. We're gonna follow your principles, your teachings. We're just gonna surrender to you and hope that you work. And he did. We got married. Emily passed her exam right away, started working in January as a nurse. I got a job offer here in my last, last month of school. Chris asked me to join the team here at the church. Married, both got jobs, steady income, 
man, God worked it out. And he's continued to bless our lives because we've just been faithful in saying, God, write our story. We trust you with our entire life. Mary's asking a great question, okay? In this fear and uncertainty, she's like, how is this gonna happen since I am still a virgin? The angel replies in verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her, early, her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. For no word from God will ever fail. Verse 37 is where we can get a new perspective. Verse 37 allows us to see the Christmas story with fresh eyes in a new light because nothing is impossible for God. No word that God has ever spoken will fail. Chris Figueredi, our lead pastor, said that the, the verse for the year for the Vineyard Church was Romans 12 too. I'm gonna read it for you. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The definition of fresh eyes is right here. Our mind, the way we see, the way we perceive things, the lens in which we view the world needs to be transformed by God's spirit. And then what we can do is test his perfect, pleasing, and good will. Fresh eyes, a new perspective. Let's hold on to that and look at the Christmas story that way. And, the, and what I get from Romans 12 too is that God can be trusted with your story. He's got a will, he's got a plan, he's got a purpose. It's good, perfect, and pleasing if you will just trust him. He can be trusted with your story. When financial struggles come and you have uncertainty about what you're going to do with, with your money, because there is none, right? Or, or you got these circumstances with your finances. Will you trust God to work it out and to write your story? When marital problems come, arguments, and you don't see a resolution, you don't see a way to fix it, will you cast it at the at the Lord's feet and say, God, write my story, work this out on my behalf. When your kids are rebellion and you don't even know how to handle them or interact with them and, and, mend, the, and mend the issue, will you trust God to write your story? When you've just been blindsided by a diagnosis that you're like, how can this be part of my story, God? Why is this part of my story? Why is this bill of health part of my script? Will you cast it on Jesus and say, hey, God, write my story. Will you respond in fear or will you respond in faith? Now, Mary, she spoke a prayer. We're gonna see that she spoke a prayer in the next verse. That is a gift to you and me. It is so powerful. A prayer that I want you to take with you. A, a prayer that I want you to speak over every plot twist, unforeseen event or circumstance, pain, hurt, frustration, confusion in your life. Speak these words over all of those because it comes directly from a teenager in a crazy moment in her life with so much fear and uncertainty that if we just partner with Mary and have the same mindset, this, the same perspective, the same view, God, it's gonna be powerful stuff because when we view the Christmas story as all calm and bright, silent night, warm and fuzzy, it removes us from the reality of what actually took place in these characters' lives, right? It removes us from the reality of how God actually brought his son into the world. And Mary got some very crazy, unbelievable, but amazing news that she was gonna be the one chosen to bring Jesus into the world. And she finally starts to embrace this. She's, she's starting to embrace what God is doing in her life. And when she starts to embrace it, she says this in verse 38, a gift to you and me. It says, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. I am your servant. I am your child. I am trusting you. May it be done to me according to your word. What you've told me, what you've promised me, I'm holding on to that, that you will actually write my story the way that you are saying you will write my story. How do you react in uncertainty? How do you react when fear and doubt come your way, blindsided by whatever happens in your life that's unforeseen? Do you react in fear? Maybe that's our default, but I want us to respond in faith and know that God can be trusted with your story. 
The best advice I can give you this morning is that speak this prayer that Mary just spoke over every single plot twist, moment of uncertainty, doubt, fear, pain, and heartache. Say, may it be done to me according to your word. Very confusing time for Mary, right? We can connect and understand that. But Mary experienced a wonderful ride of being honored to bring Jesus into the world. But you know what probably sustained her? I, sh- I think I know what sustained her is that she held on to the promises of God. What God had spoken, because no word from God will ever fail, she held on to those words. And she spoke that prayer over and over and over again. And that sustained her on this journey of bringing Jesus into the world. She said in verse 38, I am the Lord's servant. May it be done to me according to your word. That's what God's, God spoke over her. And you might be asking, well, what, God's, what, what has God spoken over me? Great question. I've compiled a short list here. It's in your program. If you want to follow along, and it'll also be on the screens. Take this program with you. Look these verses up. Reread them. Commit them to memory so that you know what God has spoken over you. Here's the list. I am a child of God. I am God's workmanship. I am totally and completely forgiven. I am God's child. I am Jesus' friend. I am a whole new person with a whole new life. I am a place where God's spirit lives. I am created in God's likeness. I am a citizen of heaven. I am greatly loved. And there's more. Do a word search in your Bible or get online and you can word search. It's really cool. And find out what God has spoken about you so that you can hold on to those promises when curveballs come, because no word from God will ever fail. This is how we should view our lives, the fresh perspective, to view our circumstance, they're temporary, to view our life as a whole, our story, view it through the lens of God, how he views each and every one of us. This is what it means, the definition of looking with fresh eyes. Now the bottom line of all of this is when you don't understand what God is doing, Remember what God has spoken. When you don't know what God is doing and you're like, God, why? Just remember what he has spoken about you because no word from God will ever fail because you are loved, you are a child of God, you are in the presence of God, you are forgiven and redeemed. And if we remember to live by these words, what God is saying about us, we join Mary in speaking that prayer of may it be done to me according to your word. We respond in faith rather than in fear. So when plot twists in your life come, blindsides, curveballs, unforeseen events and circumstance pop up in your life, will you trust the crowd? Will you trust the world and the way that they resolve these issues? Or will you trust God? Will you trust the one, the better author, the better story writer, the one who has a plan and a purpose, a will for your life that is good, pleasing, and perfect? I'm hoping you choose God. Now, When we view the Christmas story as all warm and fuzzy, calm and bright, we miss out on these very uh, powerful nuances and and subplots, and we're gonna dive into some more next week. When we can see the Christmas story through a young teenager's eyes and and, and apply the same words and the same mindset set and, and the same perspective, the Christmas story now becomes very relatable and tangible and practical and helpful and insightful for us in this life. And that's why God wrote it this way. He knew. He knew. Now, if you're in that situation right now in your life, I'm going to ask you to get prayer today. We'll have a prayer team up front here. You can come up and you can get prayer and you can ask God, say, God, I trust you. Would you show me how to navigate this and and, and work this out? Would you write my story for me? Because I can't. I've tried, and it just hurts even more, and I just keep failing. But you are the one who can do it. So if that's you, do not leave this place without getting prayer. Prayer team, if you could go ahead and make your way up here to the front, please do. If, you need, if that's you, come up to the front and get prayer. Do not leave this place. Also, the connect cards, guys, if you would, please. We're going to drop those off at the door on the way out. There will be some buckets at the door. So Merry Christmas. And I hope that you can have a new perspective as we enter the holiday, the reason for the season, look at it with fresh eyes, seeing Christmas in a new light so that God can reveal some very helpful and practical and inspiring insights into the birth of Jesus. Let me pray. Lord God, thank you so much that you did 
bring Jesus into the world for us, that we could be reunited in relationship with you. And God, thank you that we have an opportunity to look at this story from beginning to end and not just jump to the uh, exclamation point of the birth, but the process, God, of how you actually brought Jesus into the world and that we can apply the same, the same decisions and the same perspective and the same train of thought as a young teenage girl in the biggest moment of uncertainty and fear in her entire life. But God, that she spoke that, yes, I'm your servant, may it be done to me according to your word. And God, would you help us to, to, to speak those same words over the things in our life that we experience? That we would cling to you, that we would trust you to write our stories, because you're a way better story writer and author than we could ever be. Thank you for this season. Help us to remember it well. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Merry Christmas, guys. You are dismissed. Have a great day.